Hello and welcome. Uh, you are here today at the MarTech Alliance Marketing Technology Book Club. I'm Carlos Doughty, the founder of the MarTech Alliance. You can find out a little bit more about us at martechalliance.com. Today I am with Travis Wright and Chris J. Snook talking about the fantastic digital sense. Hey guys, um, would you mind jumping in and giving us a little bit more background about yourselves for our listeners? Chris, do you want to kick off? Oh, you're going to put it to me, Travis. Uh, all right. So I, uh, yeah, my name's Chris. I am the, I'm an entrepreneur. I, I'm the co-author of Digital Sense and I run World Tokenomic Forum and uh, invest in early stage businesses. I've been doing that for about 19 years and i um, happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I am Travis Wright, uh, the other co-author of Digital Sense. And if you're at the MarTech Alliance event last year, I had a keynote there. Uh, you smashed in, it as well. Thank you so much there in London town. And um, so, yeah, author. I also, uh, I run an agency in Kansas City called CCP Digital, where we do a lot of various different digital strategies and execution, also digital advertising and marketing technology consultation. And one thing that was so exciting to me, because Chris and I, we when we wrote this book, we, we had a section in the back, which was all about emerging technologies and future forward, you know, forward proofing, future proofing your business, uh, your marketing organization. And then blockchain sort of took over my focus here over the last nine months or so. And I started a podcast with Joel Com called The Bad Crypto Podcast, which is one of the top English speaking crypto podcasts now. And uh, also the vice chairman of the World Tokenomic Forum, Chris has uh, been working on putting together an amazing event in the Cayman Islands coming up here in May. So we're staying busy, folks. Indeed. And where can people find you online? Uh, you can find me online anywhere. Just Google my name. I think for the most part, I'll pop up. I'm, I, I, I dominate the front page of Google. <laughs> Finally. You're Finally. I'm Google. the real Travis Wright. <laughs> well, the real Travis Wright, please stand up. <laughs> uh, I'm just at Chris J. Snook. You can find me pretty much anywhere with that. Cool. Okay, so before we jump into the book, um, obviously you guys are very big in the blockchain space. Um, it would be great if you could give us a little bit more of an overview. Um, for anybody that's not familiar, would you mind just explaining in simple terms exactly what is blockchain and why is it important for marketers today and in the future? Mm. Well, I would say, what is blockchain? Well, blockchain is, you guys have probably heard of Bitcoin or you've heard of cryptocurrency. And the two are inherently tied together, but they're not necessarily, they don't have to be. So blockchain is essentially a distributed ledger that uh, has many nodes, many uh, different uh, computers can, can be part of the node. So anybody who wants to download the whole blockchain for, let's say, Bitcoin, they can. Everyone can have a, a copy of this record. And what happens is when a new transaction happens, it gets broadcast to the network. Everyone who has a node then gets that transaction. They see that when it goes into a block, and then they see when those blocks get solved. And when that block gets solved, boom, it gets connected to the previous block. Now it is uneditable. It is unchangeable. So it becomes this permanent, immutable record of, of what has happened, these transactions. And the way Bitcoin works is every 10 minutes when those transactions get solved, boom, a nice little reward of currently 12.5 Bitcoin pop out every 10 minutes, which miners are trying to solve these blocks and, and verify all these transactions, right? So it becomes this whole uh, really interesting process to verify things to verify transactions, to verify data entry, data in and out data. Uh, and so blockchain to me as an, as an emerging technology is one of the most interesting, one of the most interesting emerging technologies for me. And I know that Chris, you know, feels the same as well. What would you add to that, Chris? Well, I'd, I'd, I would add to it. I just um, talk about it from a different perspective, I guess. So I think, you know, we sit in a time where whether we're marketers or, or um, enterprise leaders or people reading, leading countries, we, we sit in a really interesting time in history where, you know, every hundred years or so, there's a massive shift that occurs in institutions of all kinds that have been built up over the prior hundred years begin to shift. Some disintegrate, some get replaced. 
And, and usually the technology of the day, whatever it may be, you know, in the early 1900s, it would look like the assembly line or things like that, um, or the late 1800s, you know, the, the emergence of the railroad, which then allowed for mass distribution. And so, um, you know, where we are in, in a broader context of, of internet is we're now 30 years into um, a public internet. Uh, we are coming into the final eight to 10 years of this last hundred year cycle. Um, and, uh, and, and we're seeing massive shifts in society, both globally as well as domestically. And we're, and, and we're seeing massive shifts to the way that um, economies run. And, you know, you don't have to look very far, whether it's retail or whatever, to see uh, this disruption play out. And so I think, you know, where we sit in time and where blockchain um, is exciting is, that it provides us a storage medium because that's what blockchain is as travis was saying it's it's basically a, a storage medium it's a decentralized version of it or can be a decentralized version of it. but it's a it's a storage medium um blockchain applications on top of that give business logic to that storage medium so things like smart contracts um tokens things like that allow for business logic or rules to be um, embedded and and along with debits and credits be stored and trans uh, as transactions on that storage medium. So if you think about a freight car, a block would be the container inside of the, uh, or be the freight car and then the token or the debit or credit would be the, um, the, the box inside of that freight car. So visually, you know, that's what it is. What it enables is new business models where collaboration and co-opetition and, um, you know, different economies of scale and different reductions of correspondence time or cost are being able to be seen. And at a time where we need to find cost savings and, and increase security at an all-time premium. So, um, you know, I'll leave that as the overview, but I, you know, I, it, it's a very compelling uh, protocol layer um, time in, in, in the development of blockchain and, and internet 3.0 and, and the next couple of years will be very exciting and very disruptive and, and also I think very opportunistic and hopefully lead us to some opportunities that have eluded us thus far as it relates to shared prosperity or other um, benefits. Great, thank you. Okay, now jumping into the book. If, we, um, if I had to ask the two of you to try and summarize the book in one tweet, um, I appreciate that's quite tough because there's just so much that you cover within that, but can you give it a whirl for anybody that hasn't had a chance to go through it inside and out? I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Digital Sense gives your organization a framework to build a common picture that everyone operates from as it relates to customer experience and how you deliver it. Cool. Very competitive. 150 characters, so I might need that expanded Twitter character thing that they just launched. But <laughs> You can have that. You can have that. Okay. Um, jumping in, you talked a lot about the EMF model being at the heart of your blueprint. And ultimately, a lot of individuals need to look and adopt this. How would you just, how would you really encourage people? And why would you explain makes the difference about adopting the EMF approach over others to really succeed? Well, I would say this to start off and then Chris can sort of tie it up is that, you know, if you are not paying attention to what your customer's experience is within your brand, then you're going to be losing, right? Because we live in a time now where there are so many choices we have. So, and there's so many disruptive choices around and most people are not necessarily loyal to a brand. They're loyal to themselves and the solutions to their problem. Right. And a lot of times you will come into a brand, maybe one that you have even been an advocate for and have a bad experience. And then what happens when they have that bad experience is Typically, people are more apt to share their bad experiences online than they are their good experiences. You know, most of the time, somebody can have a great five-star experience. I just had an amazing ride with my Uber driver. This guy was so hilarious and engaging, but I don't go out and share that. But man, if my Uber driver was a total jerk and then something bad happened and the technology didn't work, then I'm more likely to to maybe grump about that and people are more likely to grump about that on social media. So empathizing with your customers and, and understanding what their motivations are and building your social business strategy and building, uh, you know, and finding the right technologies to utilize, to ensure that your customers have a great customer experience, you know, really looking at all the silos, all the touch points, 
where is everywhere that that touches a customer right because the sales guy might have been great well then whenever they have a problem they talk to the customer support guy and that guy's a jerk well or that girl's a jerk well then that that taints that and so where are all the places that your customer has a touch point and have you sculpted a uh, the experience for them effectively and that's one of the things that the emf helps out with and chris will can, can add to that yeah i mean as far as how what's the easiest way to implement it um uh, you know i like keeping things that are complex simple because they're not easy right and and so it's not easy to align your company around customer as the asset or customer experience as the metric that matters um but what is simple is to figure out a way to endeavor and, and implement a strategy that could help you get there. And so um, the EMF is designed to be that uh, human beings think in pictures. If I asked you to picture your refrigerator, I have no idea what your refrigerator looks like. But as I say that, whether you want to or not, your screen of your mind is showing you your refrigerator. Is that true or false? Completely true. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if I said, does it open left to right or right to left, or is it a double door top or bottom? As I say those things, your brain is visually seeing your thing and it's saying, yup, nope, yup, nope, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's how human beings operate. And so then when you take a bunch of human beings and you put them in any kind of uh, configuration, i.e. a company or a division of a company or a team of five people inside of marketing, whatever it may be, you put them in configuration, you have five people doing exactly what we just said. The difference is instead of talking about refrigerators, right? We're talking about things like innovation. We're talking mm -hmm. about things like customer experience. We're talking about things like whatever, these nebulous items that have specific meaning that, that, that are definable, but that when we, you know, just like a refrigerator is definable, but everyone's refrigerator is personal to them. Customer experience is definable. We can say what it is. There's, you know, innovation is definable. We can say what it is, but it doesn't mean the same thing to everybody. Mm -hmm. And and so what the EMF does and why you should approach it and how and how we how we suggest you approach it is first just start with what if we all had a common picture of what it means to deliver customer experience in this company? What would that feel like? What would that look like if when I said it, you and I saw the same thing? Would that feel better or worse? Most mm -hmm. people are going to say better. Yeah. And say great. So what we're going to do is we're going to read this book and we're going to go to chapter four, uh, four through seven, and we're going to figure out just how to answer these questions. I'm going to draw them up. We're going to take some time and we're going to walk through empathy mapping and we're going to walk through, you know, the insights layer. And we're just going to start to draw our common picture. And, and so really pragmatic, that's how I would implement it. Right. I'd get around the four or five people that I, um, deal with daily or whatever it may be, whether they're direct reports or peers. And I'd ask that simple question, would it feel better? Would it work better for you if we all had the common picture? And then when they get, when they say yes, um, then you, then you just start taking that. If they say no, then find a new company or fire somebody. Right. Yeah. Like, cause if they're not interested in getting a common picture, yeah. then that's going to be pretty tough. If there's only you know what? I really don't care. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Uh, nah, I don't care. Okay, great. Either you're fired or I quit. One of the two. Yeah. All right. Hey, it doesn't really matter. We don't need the same page. It's, a, it's lunch time. It's lunch time. <laughs> it's lunch time. <laughs> and, um, and looking around, what, what organizations do you think have really embraced and social, your, your social business, um, strategy framework across all departments what organizations have you seen do that really really well uh you know i think <laughs> any <laughs> well i don't know that everyone tells us that they implement it right? yeah i, I mean think, I know we've yeah, had... we don't have a specific one that's told us that they've implemented i think again you know it's it's also early the books about uh what is it 18 months old now travis so maybe it's mm -hmm. you know it's 18 months in so i think we've seen we, you know, there's been some there's been some people inside of Oracle um, that have really, you know, uh, adopted it. But again, Oracle is a massive company. Right. So, yeah. you know, the Chicago regional office um, uh, has has, I think, implemented, you know, some of it within their team. But um, but it's not an, a, an organizational wide thing. You know, a company that I a company that I use a lot, Travis and I have different opinions on this, but, um, you know, just goes to show everybody has a different experience. You know, a company I use quite frequently for travel that that I think has, in their own way, probably implemented something close to it. They, you know, they haven't used the EMF specifically to get there, but they obviously have some framework of getting there. Is Southwest, and I and I say that because, um, 
of a couple of reasons. One, you know, there aren't too many businesses that are tougher than the airlines. There's no such thing as an easy business, but the airline business is a pretty tough, terrible business to be in. Um, and, uh, and yet, you know, it all starts with your first customer, which is your employee. And um, every, my experience has been that when I've flown places, uh, one, of the, one of the happiest sets of employees that I've run into in the airline business has been Southwest. They all seem to generally like being around each other, both on the plane, in the gate. They, they tend to seem to operate from a common, you know, um, belief or, or focus. And, and yet they all seem to be empowered to a certain degree to do their job uh, within a system, um, but with the flexibility of meeting the demands of a customer that, like Travis said, is not always in line with your operational process. So, you know, I think that they're a good example um, of how they handle stuff compared to how other people in their industry have handled stuff and also just other industries in general. I've not, I've not heard of anybody from Southwest dragging anybody off a plane, <laughs> punching them. No. Uh, and, you know, uh, and that's, that's, because, that's because you don't actually have your own seat there. That's my only problem with, with Southwest. It seems like because I don't have status there. And so I'm always like stuck in the middle in the middle seat sitting between two other big people and here I am flying on a plane like this is so great. You can buy the fifteen dollar these two can buy the fifteen dollar early bird ass. <laughs> <laughs> he puts it in he puts it in crypto instead of putting it in the seat. Yeah. Uh, so no but I think you know that's that's one company that exemplifies I think there's others that um you know that historically have done really well there. Uh you know whether it's um Four Seasons or Ritz Carlton. We have a lot of champions within different organizations, but then again, it still goes back to that whole thing where people see things differently. They have different definitions for different things. They have different priorities within their silo sometimes. And so they don't, it, it, it's difficult for organizations with so many silos and, and in, in some cases, so many different locations to get everyone on the same page. And so, you know, that's what more organizations really need to do is to be working from that one unified sort of mm -hmm. uh and, and get aligned and uh that, that will that will help them out in a lot of ways yeah one of the best companies that, that i've had some time to work with um and it was over a year ago when the book first came out but that that i think has done it really well uh has been new jersey manufacturers which is an insurance company it's been around i don't know maybe almost 100 years um and at one point in time, they dominated the market share of, of you know, good, I would say good insured clients, meaning not reckless drivers. But um, when it came to home auto and, and you know, that, that kind of configuration, a lot of these guys have, NJM uh, operated regionally in New Jersey and had about 60 some odd percent of the market and um, until deregulation happened. And, and, you know, now they've slid back to maybe 40 percent of the total insured market there. But, uh, you know, we did an implementation. We did some of the journey mapping and, and empathy mapping stuff um, with them mm -hmm. right when the book came out and some of the early EMF stuff. And, you know, they got it. They had, you know, if you can imagine this 100-year-old organization that um, during, the, during the Depression, one of the things they did from an employee benefit standpoint was provided three meals a day for all their staff. And, and to this day, they still do that as, at, at no cost. And, you know, um, somehow have maintained – you know, profitability and somehow maintained, you know, uh, the, the 30 to 40 year, I think their average client lasts 20 to 30 years from a retention basis. So their churn is really low. Why they were interested in, in doing this though, um, and, and really kind of putting the customer back at the center in the new world is because they're facing the same challenge a lot of these legacy companies are, which is what made them great at customer experience the last hundred years no longer applies, right? The baby boomer person, the 67-year-old client that loves them is not the 20-year-old child of that client, right? And so they, you know, they had, they were one of the first people to create a massive call center. One of the things they prided themselves on was, you know, every time you call, a human being is going to answer and you're not going to be through some dial-up thing. Well, that sounds awesome if you're 50, Right. If you're 25 and you're looking for your first apartment or you're looking for auto insurance and auto insurance, by the way, is going to drop because as we know, less and less millennials are interested in owning cars, right? Cause they don't have to. Um, and then generation Gen Z behind them, you know, will own even less. So now, you know, the gateway drug used to be home ownership. Well, home ownership's not happening now until the thirties because of a number of reasons. Um, so now the gateway drug is let me get your renter's insurance. Well, mm -hmm. you know, progressive and some of their competitors that are national, have really great UX, UI, you know, mobile app, manager account online. And, and, and so that user through message tech and things like that 
it, even though their parents love NJM, right? They're, and, and they listen to their parents still in that regard, the UI UX wasn't where it needed to be to get that customer to see why their parents were right. And right. so they had to create a cross-functional team to really align around what does customer experience mean to us as a legacy? What does it mean to our customer today? And how are we going to bridge to the next world? We innovated 50 years ago, but now we got to innovate again. And if we're going to continue to lead, we've got to change the way we do things. And uh, they, you know, they really... I think got buy-in at the sea level and also um, across the board because of their history in a way that was really probably one of the best examples I've seen of actually trying to implement it where they had FinOps and, and, and risk and compliance and um, sales and marketing all sitting around a table doing these exercises that we've written about. Uh, and that's where it really needs to start because that's when you get everyone's opinion, everyone's feedback and everyone buys in emotionally. So I, I think they probably are the best example I've seen of people that are endeavoring to implement this at scale. Yeah. I just want to add one thing. Like <laughs> my son is 16 and a half. He does not care about driving a car, which is so weird to me because when I was like 15, I was chomping at the bit to get my, get a car. Like, I, but now they don't need to, because you don't need a car to go talk to your friends. You can talk, their friends are all stuck inside of this phone <laughs> and they can, they can chat with them and, and they're all stuck inside Fortnite apparently now. Cool. Um, <laughs> our next question I had for you was on MarTech tools. I, one of the things I loved most about the book was the mix between having really solid strategy and framework, but actually then getting into the tactical execution and talking about some great tool sets to help accelerate <laughs> what you do. Um, what, since its publication, has popped up on your radar as some really great tools you'd also recommend? Well, there's just so many tools. It just really depends on what you're trying to accomplish. And so, I mean, if you look at you know, Brinker's landscape, there are over 5,000 of those tools. And actually in the, in the book, we put together a, a, um, a glossary of 350 of the marketing technology categories that we, the book got too thick. And so we had to take that part out. So we actually have that as like a bonus, but um, yeah, there, there's just so many technologies that are popping out. It's People ask me that question all the time. What, what tool do you think is really cool? Oh, there's just so many of them that are great and cool. What are you trying to accomplish, right? And so depending on what you're trying to accomplish, then there's different tools that are going to fit in there. And so I don't think there's one size fits all. I mean, there's really cool social tools. And really to me, you know, over these last nine months, uh, the emerging technology space, I've been mostly focusing on blockchain. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and there's a lot of really cool, blockchain marketing technologies that are popping up now it's jeremy epstein, yeah jeremy jeremy epstein uh i've been working with him and having some conversations uh, quite regularly with him and he has put together that the marketing technology landscape for blockchain businesses and it's just growing and growing and growing more and more companies are popping in there and so you know there's just an evolution now we're starting to see more of these technologies sort of you know, some of them are being acquired. Some of them are working together. Some of them are sort of, you know, I don't know if we're going to keep seeing that marketing technology landscape just keep growing and growing because now they're sort of shifting into other, um, you know, types of technologies like blockchain and being built with that new technology. I think, I'm, yeah, I just on tools, I think, you know, Travis has got uh, a link that, that we can, um, I don't know, Travis, if you have one that you can give out. I know you, you give them out custom on each event, but, you know, basically has a, has a phenomenal um, just resource pool of tools that he constantly updates. And, and you know, you, you definitely want to get on that list just if you're looking at what tools are out there by categories and, and which ones, um, you know, might make sense. I think my, you know, my list of tools are um, – a lot of times less is more, you know, I go, I keep coming back to the framework and just, you know, really helping people identify if you understand first what you're building, then you can realize which tools you actually need and which ones you don't need. I think, uh, you know, there's no shortage of companies um, out there uh, pushing tools um, and, and it can be quite overwhelming and, and there's a lot of great technology, but you win with people, you know, you can compete mm -hmm. with technology, but you win with people. And, um, that starts with your with your internal team, and then it expands to the people you care most about as your customer. And once you have that, then you can figure out how to be more efficient winning with those people using tools. So, so I kind of reframe it that way. But uh, Travis does have a tremendous um, 
I, I mean, I've never seen anything like it. Just uh, open resource that that he shares, and and so you know, we might want to put that in the show notes. Yes, yeah, that's CCP did dot digital CCP dot digital forward slash Martech is where you can go and sign up for that. But when you're talking about which which tool while he was chatting, one sort of one sort of hit me is called Tray, uh, T R A Y dot I O. Mm-hmm. And Trey is basically a Swiss army knife for all these different marketing technologies that may or may not have an API. So a lot of times you'll have a technology over here that has your data stored, but mm-hmm. you need that data to be processed and brought over here effectively in an automated way. And so what it kind of does, is it takes, you know, if this, then that and Zapier, like to the whole other level. And right. so it really helps connect tools in a unique way. So that's cool. And then, as he mentioned, ccp.digital forward slash martech, if you want to get, get access to some of those tools and whatnot. Cool. Thank you. Um, you also touched a lot on the importance of influencer marketing. Um, or thinking about it more just about relationships. Influencer marketing is a great buzzword, but actually just about relationships. And the importance of giving, giving, giving. Can you give us examples during your careers where you've had masses of success, where you have wanted to connect with some great people, um, or equally the reverse in terms of, people reaching out to you. Right. I think one of the thing is, is that depending, you know, if you want to be an influencer in a space for one, if, if this is about you wanting to be an influencer, then you have to create content relevant to that industry. Right. And you have to create a lot of it. So uh, when Joel and I, uh, my co-host with bad crypto, we decided to take on this, the, the blockchain cryptocurrency space, well, we said, we want to be influencers in the space. We want to help impact this industry. So we started creating lots of great content, right? And so who are those folks that are creating lots of great content within the industry that you're trying to influence already? Who are those people? And now we've built such a platform that we can reach out to anyone and have them, have them you know, for the most part, to try to get them on our show, like the creator of Litecoin, the CEO of Ripple. We've mm-hmm. had them on. We had John McAfee on the show. Uh we had, we just, uh, the show that's coming out on Monday, we had Scott Adams, the creator of Dilbert on the show. Uh, I just, and the, just actually an example of this the other day, uh, one of my favorite cryptos is Dragon Chain, um, based out of Seattle. They're creating this really unique hybrid blockchain solution that's going to allow anyone to get on. And I was like, man, I'd really like to have the CEO on the, on the show. I got on LinkedIn, connected with the guy, asked him if he wanted to be on the show. He said, yeah, and then connected me to press and scheduled the interview. So it's really, uh, I actually, I actually saw a video or something on this last night is that, you know, ask most people, if you ask them for help, they will help you. Right. Most people don't ask. And I know that you mentioned when we were having this little pre-chat beforehand is that, Mm -hmm. you know, that's maybe even a a part of the culture within the UK is that people kind of have their own sort of button up lip. They don't necessarily outreach for help or ask for help or, or do outreach or even ask questions in, in a webinar setting like this. Like we've not seen any questions come through, but the thing is, is ask and you will receive people are more than willing to help out. All you have to do is ask and uh, they will. Yeah. I, I think, um, you know, generosity is, is the key. Uh, it's, a, it's a core value in our company um, practice generosity with every interaction. Um, and, I, you know, I think that what does that mean? How does that show up? Um, it means it means not just being generous and offering stuff to people. It means not making them work, right? So Travis gave you kind of some examples of of people that have said yes or because he's asked. I think you know a mistake a lot of us make um, if we're if we're not as good at it as he is is when we're early on becoming an influencer. When we're early on thinking that we we endeavor to be generous. We think we're being generous. We're, we're making an offer. We're saying, Hey, can I have you on my show? Or can I, you know, write about you on my blog? Or can I do this? What we're failing to realize is that all that stuff still takes time, Mm -hmm. right? Like whoever we're asking that of, if, if they're going to elevate us, that's because they're better and busier and richer than we are in some way, shape or form, right? Richer in network, richer in capital, Mm -hmm. richer in whatever, which means their time is more and more and more and more precious than ever. So part of being generous in every interaction is generously researching and making a lot of work behind the scenes that you may or may not ever get credit for and that you're not going to even have the chance to explain that you did to the person you're asking before the ask because that is where you can um, make a difference, right? So for instance, you know, whoever you want to go get, you there's probably a bunch of stuff 
on them out there. Like there's volumes of interviews. There's a hundred plus episodes of Travis uh, just on bad crypto. Like it wouldn't be hard to figure out what he's into, what he likes, how he likes to do things, right? It wouldn't be hard to figure out with me what kind of stuff I do, have done, um, what I've done lately versus what I've done two years ago because, mm -hmm. you know, maybe I've changed what I care about and I've changed yeah. how I do it. And so by investing and being generous by not asking me to work and, and, and showing me without having to do a big diatribe about how you show me that you understand what I'm interested in, that I care about, that is a lot easier to get a yes, right? Mm -hmm. Because again, it's not just that you ask, that's number one, it's how you ask. And, you know, I get 14 or 15 inbounds a day on LinkedIn that ask me for stuff, but they don't ask the right way. Mm -hmm. There's and actually a cool, there's a cool tool on that. I want to add to that. Brother. There's this tool called Crystal Nose. And Crystal Nose is actually a tool that's like, a, they call themselves the world's largest uh, personality platform. So if you want to actually relate to someone, you know, how do they talk? What are they interested in? Just like Chris was just mentioning. And that tool actually will tell you how to speak to them. I've seen that. It's really cool, actually. It's quite accurate. So again, there's the perfect blend of, of Travis and my way of doing this, and, and which is the tool will help you will help you cheat, like ethically cheat, right? And gather information for you. But the understanding, the humanity of we only have 24 hours in a day, all of us, all of us that have made it successfully somewhere have done it because someone's been generous or done something for us that um, – they didn't have to do. We'll leave it at that. They didn't have to do it, right? Yeah. And so most people that are successful, not all, but most people that are successful, look for ways to do that for someone else. Like they're they're waiting to pay it forward, mm -hmm. but they also still have to manage their time and their opportunity costs. And so I think, you know, the blend of empathy and understanding, but then using a tool to make it scale is is right. But you can't just throw the tool at it. Otherwise, I'll get your spam and I'll ignore it because it'll say all the right things personality wise, but it won't have the understanding that I know that you actually put some work into this before you reached out. So just as an example, but I think, yeah, you know, ask, learn how to ask. And the way you learn how to ask is by not asking right and getting no response and then asking right and getting a response. And so, um, you know, influence is, is something we all have. We all have influence over something. So there is no such thing in my world as an influencer. There's just someone who has figured out a way to more densely um, collect a group of people with common interest and message to them in a relevant way. But we all have influence. It's all micro. You know, micro influencers are, you know, one of the key things now in, in a lot of different industries where maybe they don't have hundreds of thousands of followers, but my God, they have 5,000 of the exact kind of people who you're interested in. So yeah, just to, to his point, you know, that's, um, that's, uh, it's an, it's an interesting space. And, you know, I live in Kansas city and most of what I've done has been built on, you know, relationships. And it's really, we talk about, there's a, there's a part in the, in the book called bro business relationship optimization. And I discovered early on that, you know, your network is, has a direct effect on your net worth. And so you really do, you know, need to build out and build real relationships with people because in the, in the age of social media, you know, they're just a tweet away. I mean, they are, they are not un inaccessible like they used to be where you'd have to try to call and get through somebody's gatekeeper. I mean, you are, you are so easily tied into anyone you want to get in touch with today that it's ridiculous. And you're an example of that, Carlos, because how many amazing people have you got on this webinar series that you just reached out to? Yeah, yeah. It, it's the, the people I'm working with, like your good selves, I mean, I couldn't appreciate more of the time you're giving. It's fantastic. Um, but also yeah, just know, to, to your point, though, like you did certain things, right? You've branded this a certain way. You have the kind of cartoonish thing of you, you know, holding the thing and everyone's book cover, like – that's being generous right now. You're speaking, and why I say that is because I'm not going to go have one of our design team or whatever ask Travis to go make up a new poster, right? So, so what's generous is you go, okay, this guy's serious. He's, you know, he's put some work into this. He's he's accumulated a couple other people that we know um, that that obviously have also bought in uh, to give him some of their time. And he's given us something we can share and he's, and it's on message and it's not like violating our brand or it, like there was, 
there was obviously work and thought and effort that went into before you even made the ask. And that's all I'm getting at is right. It becomes a lot easier to say yes when you're basically saying, you know, what works best for you? I've got something in April and you're doing that in January because then we can look at it. We can say, yeah, we can do the 20th. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and meanwhile, we know that uh, all we have to do is show up and answer questions. And so, um, you know, that, that's a good example of, of just what we're talking about. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Um, flipping over to giving a little bit of advice here um, for CMOs. What one bit of advice would you give to any CMO right now at a large enterprise? Oh, man. I mean, I, you know, I, I tread lightly on giving advice. I think what I, what I see is I see um, a big shift. You know, there, I was just with uh, 5,000 marketers, CIOs, CMOs, kind of people across the, the IT and the uh, marketing spectrum at, at Modern CX out in Oracle um, and in Chicago. And, you know, one of the stats, I forget what the exact number was, so I don't want to misquote it, but it was, it was a majority of, like it was more than, you know, more than half of CMOs now actually um, have P&L as, as their responsibility. They have a metric that they never used to have, right? They used to have more qualitative uh, metrics like brand, but now, um, you know, industry-wide, more, more and more and more CMOs actually have P&L responsibility or they, they have revenue as a target. And, and I think so, you know, what, what I see most CMOs rapidly trying to adjust in is to this cross-training effect of, um, you know, the old school CMO is no longer really the right fit for the job. It's kind of like, a, you know, a drop back quarterback that can't run really doesn't have a chance to play anymore, right? You've got to be able to run, pass, um, and, and be a different kind of athlete. And, and so I think as a CMO, that's what they're seeing, right? They have to have a deep understanding of data science and, and, um, but they don't have to be, you know, a CIO, but they have to understand it and they have to value it and, and strategically understand where it fits. And then they have to still be able to understand how to create a message and, and propagate brand and own that. And then all that has to tie back to, did the needle move? Like did, did money come in? Was there, some ROI that is quantifiable. And, and so that becomes, you know, more of a sales and, and biz dev type hat that they have to wear as far as responsibility goes or accountability goes. So uh, I think it's just about becoming new again, right? Finding that, finding that childlike curiosity um, and that passion to learn and evolve and, and to master a new aspect of your craft. And so my advice would be, either get out um, or get new and get excited again and learn. Mm. Yeah. You know, the, the, the whole space has changed. You know, you have to be data driven. Now you also, you know, you more of the budget is for, for marketing technologies is coming through the CMO um, and, and more revenue. So a lot of times in these B2B organizations, Marketing is responsible for getting that customer from zero to about 80%. And then sales is doing that other 20% now, right? And kind of put them over the edge. Like, how are your videos? How is your content like for each stage of the customer? So, you know, as a CMO, you know, you're looking at each step of the customer journey, where they are at each step, your place. You want to figure out what messaging is for each particular place to make sure that you're moving those customers towards sales. Because as Chris had mentioned back in the day, it was all about branding. It was all about, hey, do people, are, are they, are we building awareness? And now it's about trying to get them and drive them down the funnel. And, you know, there's some really interesting organizations out there that have different philosophies on how to do things. You know, some of them are hiring generalists, right? And like, oh, I want somebody who knows a little bit about everything. And then some are saying, nope, we want to just dive in. I want to have this person focus only on this and this person focus on that. And, and you know, so there's there's different, you know, types of, of, of things that work with different organizations. And I think that you have to find out what works well within your industry and how you want to structure your team, how you want to structure your, your messaging. And, you know, always be testing and iterating because the space is changing so quickly. You know, what is it? most CMOs have a job for 18 months still or something like that. And, and so you have to be quick. You don't have that. You don't have that warm and fuzzy feeling 
you know, like, all right, let me get six months into the job just to kind of feel it out. It's like, you got to be on the ground running. And so that's why I think that, you know, uh, the advice for a CMO would be, you know, read those internal chapters of digital sense to give you those frameworks uh, that will help you sort of set up your customer experience more effectively and empathize with your customer more effectively. And it will help you get on point quicker. And so that's one of the reasons why we built it, not just for CMOs, but anyone within a marketing organization. And um, it's obviously been 18 months since you published. If you were adding a new chapter now, what would that be on? Um, or is there, ever a, is there possibly a new book in the making? Um, well, I, yeah, I don't know if we'd add a new chapter. I think um, I, for digital sense, I, and I say this humbly because I, I, I it's, it's just honest. I, I, I think we did really well. And, and I think that, you know, what we've gotten as far as feedback, I certainly want all the feedback from you guys listening to this that have read it because every new reader matters as much as the last, but you know, the feedback we've gotten is that it, it was a really valuable and helpful and readable book and, and that it's, that it's got real utility to it. Um, so I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't think we would, I, I don't know that I would want to add anything to, to digital sense. Um, you know, when the when the publisher asks if uh, for a second edition or a paperback, I'm sure we'll update it and we'll put more in the future proofing chapter as it relates to what we've mutually learned the last year, uh, being fully immersed in, you know, the blockchain related world because we didn't speak a ton about that in there. So I think any future editions of it, as it relates to future proofing, we'll update that final chapter and expand on it. But um, I, you know, I have a new uh, I have a new book coming out. Um, with Bon and Bao and, and um, Danny DeMichelle called Rebooting Retail that um, takes some of what we talked about here, but but applies it and, and highlights case studies within the retail sector, which obviously has been disrupted. Mm -hmm. uh, that'll be coming out in next January. Um, but, uh, but you know, I think Digital Sense is, is what we wanted it to be, Travis, right? I mean, we, we wanted a book that would be relevant for the next five to 10 years, if not beyond. The framework will be relevant for uh, I think for, you know, as long, uh, as long as people are operating businesses, cause it's, it's, it's generic enough, but focused enough where it can evolve with trends. Um, and, and so I think we accomplished what we wanted with this book and, and, you know, and, and um, that's my answer. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I think that there are, are so many different interesting developments that are going to continue to happen. Machine learning, AI, chat bots, 5g. I mean, we talked about those in the book, they're coming. Um, I think that <laughs> I think I could probably write another book now at this point called Digital Sense, all about cryptocurrencies and, and blockchain. Just spell just spell the book title a little different. C E N T S, <laughs> right? I don't know if anybody uh, Snook. I don't know if anybody's ever written a, written two books with the same phonetic title having two different subject matters. I don't know if that's. No, ever, I don't think that's ever happened. happened. We could actually uh, we could literally could actually do that. I don't think there's too many words that allow for that. So you know you should. Uh, <laughs> well, then we could actually do the third book once that we get digital smells together because then we could have digital <laughs> sense with that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. then we could have brace. <laughs> uh, well, you Three know, so the same title. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. So I think, I think Carlos, I think the, um, you know, the thing that, that works about digital sense, this version um, is that really it's a book about human beings um, and organizations and, and common sense in a digital world, right? Digital mm -hmm. sense. And so, um, you know, that, that, that's the really underlying thing that the trends we say, quite frankly, half of what we write about in here might be obsolete by the time it's out, but what won't be obsolete is EMF and what won't be obsolete is the ability for you to figure out mm -hmm. which thing to apply next. Right. And, and so um, it seems like we've delivered on that promise with the people who've read it and, and, and enjoyed it. And, and I think that, um, you know, books are kind of those things you do when they make sense to do. Um, Travis and I aren't, you know, writing books uh, or not writing books because we need to get them out. We're writing it because we think there's a reason to um, expand or, or bring something new to market that could be valuable and stand for a while. Uh, I'm, I'm really proud of the effort that he and I were able to put into this. And it was a, you know, it's been a great relationship. Um, and you did it all remotely. That, that, that was yeah. the other thing that was really interesting, how you wrote it um, with Messenger and Google Docs, not in person. I was really impressed that, it, you know, what's funny is we literally, like, it was so funny is we literally hung out one time in Denver in 2013 and 
I don't even think by the process of us writing the book, we had never even saw each other the second time. Yeah. I mean, and none, and none of that was like, I don't, we didn't plan it that way. That was just like, that was just the reality, right? Was that um, we didn't need to see each other. It wasn't that we, but we didn't plan it. Like we did, we did Skype calls and we did other stuff. Yeah. And we had, we had these kind of face to face kind of things. We were mapping out what we wanted to talk about and how the book was going to, you know, the, the subject matter. And as we were sort of walking through the whole thing. So we, it's not like we didn't, you know, that's a great thing about video, right? Carlos, here we are right now having yeah. a video us three right now. It's like, we're in the same room. I mean, when you're doing a video conference, it's, uh, that's why when, 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 in my, at my agency, like we like to do video calls for the most part, because it feels like you're in the room with them. You're connected with them. It's a much better than just a phone call. And so we had quite a few of those, but we were able to map it out and plan it over time without actually hanging out. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the funniest part, and we kind of realized it after the fact, and, and we talked about it is the, the funniest part was as we, so we submitted the manuscript, it was like 88,000 words and we're all excited. And, um, and then Wiley goes, it's 23,000 words too long. Uh, <laughs> and we're like, Oh crap. You know, so you think you're done, you exhale, and then you got to find a way to cut, 23,000 words out, um, which we did by basically making the MarTech glossary piece of it a uh, separate downloadable ebook and, and things that, you know, you can get. That was um, a nice little chunk to take off. That was like, which that, but, then, but then we still had to shave like another 5,000 words. So then I'm, I'm yeah. like frantically trying to figure out how to keep the narrative together, but, but, you know, cut stuff without cutting. And it was, and it was a great exercise actually like editing always is. It was just a painful one. And as we're doing that, um, Travis was uh, through his KOL relationship with Huawei um, on a trip and and like busy and he was flying to China. And we had this like, if we didn't get it by, I forget if it was August 15th or what the date was, Travis, but it was somewhere like in August. It was either August 15th or August 31st. There was this drop dead date where we basically were going to have to can the thing. Like we wasn't going to go out in time and we were going to miss our deadline and it wasn't going to release. And, and so we had to get it done. And he was on a plane. And, um, and 15 hour flight, 15 hour flight to Shanghai. And so, yeah. uh, I pulled, you know, um, a couple of 20 hour plus days in a row. And then on the 15 hour flight, we were in Google docs and he was on spotty Wi-Fi, you know, flying to China. And, um, and we, I don't remember what time we went to bed that morning. Not only did we re we read and edited the whole book during that 15 again. minutes, that 15 yeah. hours again. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and then we got it done right in time it was about 15 minutes before you reach the shores of china and then you hit the great firewall of china where they block <laughs> facebook and block <laughs> google and all that and then so then you have to get yourself a vpn through Hong yeah Kong. there was i forget what it was but there was some final tweak and we didn't catch it before i went to bed at like 4 a.m and he was in that 15 minute window. We didn't catch it, whatever it was. And it was some final tweak. And it wasn't one where it wasn't a big thing, but it wasn't one where I was willing to just make the call without having him right, right. buy in. I can't remember what it was, but it was, it was something in the final chapter. And I was like, I got to change this. They need, you know, I need you to respond. And he was, um, he was in line at like uh, Disneyland on a, on a hacked VPN. Um, and, and somehow. Yeah, was Shanghai, it Shanghai Disney with Robert Scoble. <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, we're getting ready to get on Pirates of the Caribbean, which is the most unbelievable augmented reality uh, roller coaster ride experience ever. And uh, finish the book in line. <laughs> in on like, yeah, on his phone through yeah. Google Docs. So when we finally did that, we went, well, we actually, you know, we're actually legit. Like we use digital sense to figure out a way around the firewall of China <laughs> into Google to finish the edits in time to get this thing out. So we're, we're, we're credible. That's, that was kind of the, yeah. Uh, well, it's a fantastic book. Really, and then, really. then a couple of weeks later, he's in Tucson, and that was the second time we'd ever actually been face to face. Was in Tucson. Like I drove down, and and we, mm -hmm. uh, but that was after the thing was done. So it was pretty funny. So just wrapping up, my final question for you guys. Um, you talked quite a lot about some fantastic books and authors throughout. You talked about Brian Solis's X, Gary V's Jab Jab Right Hook, Kevin Kelly's The Inevitable. I absolutely love that book. Uh, Roland Smart's Agile Marketing. Um, incidentally, actually, Gary and both Roland are in this same um, book club as well. Um, but my question was, are there any other books you've read recently that you'd recommend for us to pick up and look about trying to introduce in the future? Well, I've, I've read these books numerous times, but I Travis knows what I'm going to say. Um, I, 
I recommend several books. Uh, the four that I would give you that have nothing to do with marketing um, would be uh, – in, in no random or in somewhat a random order, I would read The Fourth Turning by Neil Howe and William Strauss. Came out in 1997. Um, I'd push through the first 60 pages and just and and grit and bear it because it's it's smart stuff and it's a little it feels a little muddy. Mm -hmm. But um, but once you get through about the first 50 or 60 pages, you'll understand exactly why you're reading the whole book. And and I think it's really good context for where we are as a cycle in history and 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 what we face ahead and. So it's a really important book that way. I'd read Rebecca Costa's The Watchman's Rattle, which came out in like 20, <clears throat> I think, 2011. And I would read, which talks about evolutionary biology and limitations and then compounding, you know, technology complexity that human beings manufacture that causes collapses and, and a way around it. So I'd read that. And then I'd read uh, The Everything Bubble by Graham Summers, which is the short um, but very succinct and equally powerful uh version of um, something like G. Edward Griffin's Creature from Jekyll Island, which is, you know, a must read if you want to understand how the world works. Um, but that's like a doorstop, you know. So those are the four I would read. Yeah. So a couple of the ones that I've read recently that had a big impact on me is I, I finished uh, Sapiens not long ago. And uh, mm -hmm. Sapiens is just it's by uh, Yuval Noah Har Harani. That is just such a great book. I mean, I, I listened to it on Audible on a, on a few flights and talking about how Homo sapiens have evolved over time, how we are the most destructive animal ever on the face of the earth. And it's in our nature to be the way we are. And it's just interesting. Uh, it's an interesting perspective. Uh, another book, and it's actually, I think this is a, a book from uh, that, that you'd recommended not long ago, uh, Snook, Cyber, Cyber, uh, Psycho Cybernetics. Which is yeah, a pretty that's, interesting. That's, book. One my, that's one of my all-time favorites for sure. Yeah, that was a really solid book. Also, the the Code of the Extraordinary Mind is a book that I read all, uh, recently. So I'm always, you know, and and there's another book too that. So we, as I mentioned, we interviewed um, uh, Scott Adams on Bad Crypto that comes out on uh, Monday, the 23rd of April, and he wrote a book called How to Fail at Almost Everything and Still Win. And that book is so great because it talks about things that I had inherently figured out on my own. And that is skill stacking and talent stacking and leveling up your skills one at a time. So like maybe you learn how to edit videos like, well, that's a cool little skill that you now have. Oh, maybe you learned how Facebook ads work. Oh, now you got that little skill. Oh, now you've developed this here. Oh, you've you have a blog that you've written. So you got some blog writing skills. Oh, now you've had this over here. Oh, now you can write for a column over here. Now as you've leveled up this skill over here. Oh, you have a podcast. You've learned how to do podcast. Oh, you're doing this webinar. Now you have that skill. And so what you do is you do the skill stacking and then you end up developing more skills in sweet spots than other people have, which enables you to execute on more things than other people can. Because when we decided to do bad crypto, we decided that on G on uh, July 16th, we made the decision to do it. We ended up launching it on July 18th, less than 48 hours later. We came up with the name. We had the, we had the branding locked down. We launched the website, put the WordPress site up, added all the plugins to the Words WordPress site. We launched Libsyn. We launched our our podcast thing. We set up our our intro music. We created this. We mashed up all these different things to create our intro song. We recorded our first podcast. We launched our first podcast, and by the end of that next. 24 hours, we had over 2000 listens to our podcast. So it's just a matter of making a decision, being a quick mover. But if you have over time level, you know, leveled up your skill stack, then you're able to execute on things much quicker than other people are. And you're able to, uh, I think in some ways then iterate from there. You don't have to be perfect at first, but then start iterating and making it better and implementing these new things. But dude, it's just, you know, sometimes you just got to go. And if you've spent those times, building up your technology stack and your own personal skill stack, then you become more valuable over time than your peers. Most of your peers are watching bullshit television and they're spending time wasting, wasting their time on video games and they're wasting their time watching movies. They have a job that they hate. They come home, watch TV until they go to sleep and then wake up and have their own personal groundhog day every day. But what I've decided to do over my time on this planet is to keep leveling up my skill stack and then that way it keeps me being relevant over time and it helps us see things that other people don't see and it helps us see them quicker because we understand trends and we see 
how the world starts to evolve. Yeah, I, I, um, I'll close out with this because that was really good. I, you know, I was with Bonin the other day, Bonin Bao, and um, we were talking about rebooting retail. And he was, he was at an event the day before with about 15 people, one of which was Derek Jeter um, in this kind of uh, meeting slash mastermind down in Florida at the stadium. And he said that Jeter said something to the group that was really interesting. So I'm stealing it. Um, you know, Derek Jeter, for, for those in London who don't watch American baseball, uh, it, you know, was a Yankee. He was one of the, you know, best players probably in the history of the game. But Jeter said to the group of, of these, like, massive people that are really successful, the culture in sports is, and, and in, in our world that we came out of is ASAP, right? He's like, when, you, when, you're, when, you're in the, when you're in the major leagues or when you're in any professional sport, ASAP is the culture because – there there's only the next at bat there's only like there's only the next play like the game that you're in right now is the only game that matters but the season stacks on each game and and so like I think that it was funny because as soon as I was listening to Bonham share that Jeter was sharing this to them I'm like yeah that's me like I'm ASAP like that's what I do that's how Travis lives it's I don't I don't have to figure it all out right it's just whatever I'm going to focus on today like I'm going to crush that today like Mm -hmm. it's it's that daily stacking of incremental improvement and then over time it looks like all of a sudden you're this magician um but you know it it's it's just the summation of all that incremental daily activity and Mm -hmm. and sometimes you don't even know why you're doing it sometimes you don't connect the dots of hey 10 years from now like travis just explained when they launched back crypto he didn't he didn't know he was going to do that show six years ago when he learned some of those things you well, just, that's exactly that's, that's exactly what Scott Adams talked about in the podcast is that it's goal oriented versus systems oriented and your system is leveling up my skills learning this growing here doing this because maybe six years ago I said oh my god I can't wait to be the most unbelievable myspace you know consultant right or 10 years ago or whatever right because myspace doesn't exist now so sometimes your goals get a little out of alignment but your systems and your processes never will. And if you're working on constant and never ending improvement, which is sort of a Tony Robbins acronym, can I constant never ending improvement, getting better, leveling up your skills, then that just puts you in the right place at the right time. Right. Because that's what luck is, is opportunity meeting preparation. Yeah. Thank you very much. Really, really fantastic feedback there. Um, and I just want to also say a massive thank you for taking the time to chat with us today. Um, and thanks, thanks for our listening. listeners for locking in. Yeah. Thanks, thank guys. You. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much. Cheers.